welcome to the program, State Representative Jackie Chan of Quincy, also Dr. Abe Abdul Abdul Wahid of Lux Dental here in Quincy about a uh, proposal to eliminate sales tax on PPE, personal protective equipment. And uh, Abe, I guess this was uh, something that you kind of thought would be beneficial uh, to folks in your field. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. As you know very well, uh, for all small, for many small businesses, pretty much all public-facing small businesses, uh, PPEs are critical. Uh, they're not optional. They're not a choice. Uh, without PPEs, we really can't function, and particularly in the medical field. Um, gloves, uh, face masks, uh, face shields, uh, and w- with us in the dental field, there are tremendous volumes of PPEs that are necessary in order for us to provide care safely and appropriately for our patients. Um, you know, as always, Representative Chen has been very much uh, receptive to new ideas to protect the public and also benefit our profession. So I had approached uh, Representative Chen in regards to how could we laser focus um, initiatives that would benefit the public, benefit small business, and also benefit the healthcare industry. And that's why we're here today to talk to you about why it's important that we try to eliminate sales tax on PPEs. So, Jackie, what did you think when uh, Abe came to you with this idea? Yeah, we had a conversation about this and the challenges, uh, obviously, in the dental industry at the time, but we started thinking a little more broadly about how the PPE has become part of our lives. Beyond just the mask mandate, you know, we are u- using it more often, um, even, you know, at home and going outdoors and driving around and everything else. Um, like, you know, don't leave a, don't, it's like, uh, don't leave home without it from the old uh, uh, credit card, turn which credit card it was, but the old credit card ad, it's like, yeah, don't it leave your, American Express with Carl Malden. <laughs> yeah, the Amex card. So the same thing now. I mean, you can't leave home with your mask. Same principle. But as we're, we're discussing the matter, uh, well, the dental profession, you know, uses a lot of PPE. You think about people at storefronts, people, you know, trying to run their business, small business, but even people commuting these days. And unlike uh, hospitals, and uh, they're not, they're not, they're not for profits. So, what about everybody else? So, if you're a not-for-profit agency, you don't pay sales tax to begin with. The you know, big hospitals are not-for-profit agencies, but everyone else isn't. And since this has become a necessity, and under the Massachusetts sales tax, necessities are not sales tax. I know it's a little bit. If you look at the law, it can be a little bit like, well, what's necessary? What's not a necessity? What's what the state says? So, for example, non-packaged food is a necessity. So you don't have a sales tax on it, for example. Periodicals are not sales taxed. So we do provide sales tax exemptions for very specific things um, that we consider a necessity in our lives. And PPE has become it. So would this be a, a permanent exemption or temporary? I uh, have uh, put the bill in as a per- permanent exemption. Obviously, like all bills in the legislature, it's up for conversation about where it's going to go. But I think uh, we're going to be living like this for some time. And uh, any way we can help businesses out on what has become an essential product uh, to operate, I think is, is crucial. So a lot of the issues are sales tax exemptions, personal needs. Um, like I said, we eat, so there's food, so personal need. But this is beyond just that, you know, the way uh, the world we're living in right now. So, I mean, d- does the bill that you file actually define what PPE is, actual specific items? Yes, I uh, define basically three, uh, four kind of items. So uh, I define a face covering that actually covers your mouth and nose. It doesn't matter if it's cloth or paper or whatever, it's got to be doing both. Or face shield, but a face shield actually covers your entire face. So I actually have to do those those products. We require gloves, but it has to be a um, uh, not quite medical grade gloves, but it's not like ski gloves, that makes sense. You know, you're not using cloth gloves. You have to use a degree of, uh, of uh, material that's uh, water resistant. Can't remember the name of the material, actually name the materials. And, the, and we also provide um, some medical grade smocks so you know we think about it well i don't need a smock well yeah but if you're in food services a smock becomes pretty important much more important but it's a not just you know just any kind of apron you actually have to have a, a medical grade item which medical offices would use veterinarians offices would use 
Um, and, you know, I would think food services and other places where uh, you find it challenging to get conventional items would turn to PPE if it becomes available and uh, want to encourage better quality products to be used um, in retail as well. Sure. Any estimate as to how much that would cost the state in, in sales tax revenue if that were to pass? No idea. Um, we haven't used this much of this material, I think, ever in the state this past year. I'm, I'm going to bet that the amount of material we use on masks and gloves and smocks, I mean, no one had a face shield <laughs> until this this past year. Well, so, maybe just a, a welder, perhaps. That's about it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you have to eat a profession where you have to have that type of shield. You know, emergency medical personnel, hazmat people, and right, uh, iron ones for, uh, steel ones for uh, welders. But uh, I, I don't really know because it was such an abnormal situation, uh, and uh, the sheer volume of it's used, and it's all dis- you know it's all disposable. If people throw a mask, people throw away gloves. I know you can rewash uh, cloth gloves, but only a limited number of times. So, you know, this is kind of uncharted territory, and the cost to Commonwealth. Uh, I would I don't know yet. It, it's it's you can't use any number prior uh, pandemic because th- those figures wouldn't make sense. So, Abe, would something like this really help, you know, you and your business and and in your colleagues' businesses? Absolutely. And when we're talking about cost, it's important to uh, focus on the fact that the cost of business, the increased cost of business is costing some of our small businesses to close. Uh, That in itself is a loss of revenue uh, to the state and to the city, and not to mention the loss of, you know, employment opportunities when small businesses close. So it's prudent and critical that we support small businesses uh, and especially the healthcare industry uh, in order for us to continue to provide care. Uh, There's been a survey that was done very recently by the Medical Group Management Association where they've indicated that 98% of healthcare, uh, healthcare facilities have reported increases in their overhead due to PPEs. 15% reported a cost increase of 101%. 16% reported it up to 41 to 50%. I mean, these are astronomical numbers. Uh, if we're trying to pro- continue to provide care, access to care, uh, it's important that you know the state uh, facilitates us in doing so. And PPE has become a, a huge issue for us. Uh, you know, there's a global shortage of PPEs. Uh, there, there are speculators out there. Uh, so it's it's become very, very difficult for us uh, to keep our operations intact. So, you know, initiatives like this will certainly help not only the medical field, but all small business and even families that have now had to go out and purchase PPEs that they normally wouldn't have to do so. What was it that initially uh, inspired you to, to propose this? Was there one single event that occurred or some, did somebody tell you something that, that it's, you know, shot up a, a spark in your mind and said, oh, let's make a change here? Almost, we are forecasting about 20% of dental providers uh, no longer, not, not willing, but no longer being able to continue in being Medicaid providers. 20% of dental facilities uh, you know, nationally, are are at the verge of no longer being able to become Medicaid providers. That is huge. That's that's a large number. Uh, we need to continue to provide access to care to everybody, to the whole entire spectrum of this country. And if twenty percent are no longer able to provide care, uh, what are we going to do with those patients? Knowing this, you know, we need to really focus on initiatives to help healthcare providers to continue to be able to sustain and provide care. So Tacky and I have been sitting here, uh, you know, trying to brainstorm, trying to think of ways that we can help our community. And this is just one of the many initiatives that we've been considering. What's the process, Tacky, for this bill now? Where is it sitting? Where is it going? Well, the legislative session just start as our Tacky Talk on Friday. So we're going to plug my Tacky Talk with you. (laughs) <laughs> so tune in on uh, the weekends. You, you get a YouTube from us someplace. But uh, no, the final deadline is the third Friday in February. So because of the pandemic and the way we're working virtually and just the challenges of technology and everything else, um, we've extended deadline for filing to the, the third Friday of February. Staff informs me that co-sponsoring is going to be available for one week after the filing deadline. 
so they go right up to the first day of March, I believe, or just before. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, my staff is right now trying to get the bill priority list together. People have seen my list in the past. It's quite extensive how many things I filed. So we uh, should have the computer system open soon uh, for us to file. But bill's drafted. We're just waiting for the system to be activated at this stage. Okay. And, I mean, do you want to take a guesstimate as to how, how much support it will receive and if, it, if the governor would even support it? I don't know what the governor would do because... He never tells us what he's going to do anyway. It's his MO. Uh, but as far as our colleagues in the legislature, we'll start uh, shopping the bill around once the system is open for people to co sponsor. It's, 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 it's pointless to ask for something that they can't sign on to because they can't log into the system to sign on to. Um, and the way the system's set up, uh, we can't sign you on. You have to sign yourself onto a bill. Doesn't make sense. So you don't have fraudulent sign ons. So yes. until the system's activated, we're kind of stuck on the co-sponsors. But I'll be reaching out to some other industry folks beyond Dr. Abe and the dentists. But I'll be reaching out to some other industry folks as well to discuss it with them about um, uh, mustering some more support for a bill like this. Okay. Dr. Abe, where um, do dentists stand right now in the, in the line for vaccinations? Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, we are in phase one. But having said that, uh, it's been, there's been a slight delay, uh, well, maybe a major delay in terms of providing us uh, access to the vaccine. Um, you know, the Dental Society has reached out. Uh, Representative Chan has also written to the executive in terms of inquiring about this. Uh, but we are in phase one, but we appear to be at the tail end uh, of phase one. And uh, as you know very well, uh, and so does Taki, uh, we do generate aerosol. And as you know, uh, even during the pandemic, many of us had uh, been on the front lines trying to help divert uh, emergency patients from our hospitals so that dental emergency wouldn't inundate the hospitals. Uh, as you all know, uh, you know, right now, we are, we've even volunteered as a profession to vaccinate patients. So the oral health, the dental health community, and I mean the team, not just the dentists, uh, we've always been the forefront in terms of serving our community and doing the best we can. Uh, so it's been a little bit of a disappointment uh, that there has been a lack of clarity in terms of uh, where, where, where and when uh, our profession, the dentist, the hygienist, the assistants, the administrative uh, staff uh, would get vaccinated. So um, that's basically where we stand. Hmm. What are you hearing about that, uh, Bacon Hill, Jackie? Well, the... Frankly, us in the legislature is also somewhat confused about this. Uh, when they put out the first list of vaccination priorities, they changed it again in two days. Then they changed it again in three days. And then they changed it again last week. Um, and this has continued to be an ongoing saga between the legislature and the executive branch. We, we don't have a say in the vaccination priority list. Uh, make that very clear to everybody. You can call me. Happy to listen to your concern. I'm willing to convey your concerns to the um, to the executive about your interest to move a profession up. But just to let everyone know, legislators are not on the list whatsoever. Government officials are not. Appointed government officials are not. We're lumped in just like everybody else regarding our licensed professions. If you're a licensed profession, in my case, lawyers are not anywhere in one or two. Uh, we're definitely in the bottom of the pack. So um, there is no special uh, preference there. Uh, you know, the, our, my colleagues have expressed concerns a few more than once now about you know, some better clarity uh, about everything, whether it be subdivision of healthcare providers or even issues such as uh, people with severe autism and uh, the difference between a day hab versus a day program. Because day habs are listed in the phases, but day programs for people with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, I'm sorry, developmental. I can't remember these old, they keep changing the anagrams on me, but every, every person with developmental issues is not listed in the phase list. So we're not sure where they all fit in either. So if you're in one program, but not another, where do you go? And this is causing a lot of confusion and anxiety among folks that I've been getting calls on. And I don't have an answer for them because you're just looking the list. It, it it's, doesn't state your specific circumstance. Yeah. So, Yes. You know, we'll continue to advocate to the executive branch of the COVID-19 command center to get greater clarity about um, everything from medical profession 
you know, right into phase two folks. Um, like if you're age 65 and you work at a grocery store, you're ahead of the line than just 65 year old person that's accountant. So this has been brought up to me by our favorite district attorney more than once about how does this logic work? And frankly, I am confused as well because uh, your risk of death raises significantly the older you are in your different health conditions. So not like you shouldn't get front-facing workers um, vaccination, but if you're a, a person as a front-facing worker that has to be a 65, of which there are plenty of, uh, and you vaccinate them along with everyone else is 65, you capture the whole audience that are highest risk of death first. Yeah. As opposed to trying to do the whole a professional segment. So it's very interesting how the governor's vaccination program is set up. It's designed around professional de the description, job description, uh, not around uh, entirely around age and health conditions. And I think this is one of the big confusions that's going on here. Uh, with the legislature and the general public regarding the vaccination list. Yeah, I know we've talked about this before on our, our uh, podcasts, but I know you, you seem to think that this needs to be more of kind of a like almost a military operation where, where emergency management steps in and, and, and really kind of, you know, designates mass vaccinations. Well, the Biden administration apparently listened to us in our podcast. Uh, he's already directed FEMA to direct the all 50 states MEMA to then direct all the field emergency management below MEMA in the municipal and county levels to develop a fac vaccination distribution program. So uh, it looks like Joe Biden uh, thinks this is a great idea. Uh, it's going to take time, of course. I mean, FEMA is not going to magically snap their fingers and put together, but given the fact their expertise is rollout emergency management, I expect uh, them to start putting a plan together or some, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this awful, but it's going to be some vague details early on. I suspect in the first couple of weeks from FEMA and in greater detail as they start to come to a final plan. Yeah. I think uh, the president's asked for a 30 day report from FEMA, if I remember correctly. So I, I suspect in the first week we can get some vague trickling of information that before it becomes more, uh, more clear. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean that right now, uh, you know, it's being done through pharmacies, um, hospitals, uh, not have food centers, but even my healthcare provider, because I use Atrius Healthcare. They've informed me they don't have vaccine. They informed me by email that they have Moderna and they will eventually open a scheduling time for them um, with people more comfortable doing it in a medical setting versus the Gillette. Um, I'm not saying one is better than another. I think it's a comfort level of individuals about what setting they'd like to get the vaccine in. So, um, you know, we're all in wait and see mode. Yeah, I know the town of Braintree uh, is accepting um, uh, applications, uh, registrations, if you will. I don't know if they have a vaccine yet. I don't know, um, you know, how much they have, if they do have any, but it's starting to trickle down to the community level. Well, as Dr. Abe correctly points out, you have to have people that actually know how to put a needle in an arm. I mean, that's also part of it as well. So, um, you know, obviously we're not going to inoculate each other. Well, Dr. Abe knows how to inoculate because he knows how to use a needle, but I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. So, you know, there's a logistics there, I think, as part of consumer confidence in healthcare that you have somebody there that would do it correctly. And of course, you have to be monitored afterwards to see if any adverse effects, which are very, very low uh, possibility, but safety is a concern. Mm -hmm. So despite just getting an inoculation, you do have to stick around in one spot and have somebody there that's medically capable to address an issue. If you're one of the very, very, very small percentage of folks that could have an adverse reaction. Yeah. Dr. Abe, you know, you'd mentioned that obviously the dental profession has been dealing with the aerosol infections for centuries, I guess. Uh, what can, say, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, learn about safety from the dental profession? That's a, that's a very good question. It's the first time I've ever been asked. I'll tell you this. The dental profession has had a very, very long-standing tradition of being exceptional in the area of infection control. Um, you know, there's been less than 1% transmission to dentists, uh, and we don't, we're not even sure whether the transmission occurred within our dental practice. Uh, we are meticulous in terms of, uh, you know, managing uh, infectious uh, byproducts. Uh, we are masters in universal precautions. We've been utilizing universal precautions, meaning that we assume uh, any 
patient, every patient, every source is a potential infectious source. I think that um, a lot of these practices that you know we've been conducted uh, are very, very well known. And um, you know, once again, the dental industry, as always, we stand ready to serve and educate in any way we can in terms of uh, helping our colleagues out. Uh, we we've already stood you know stood up front, stood up to in, to in order to help vaccinations. We want to make sure that if there is a need for vaccinations, vaccinators, uh, we will be there. Uh, when we are ready to serve. All right. Anything else you'd like to add, gentlemen? Well, I mean, continuation of reminding folks that you know definitely wear masks, good hygiene. As I keep complaining about the fact that everyone should know how to wash their hands at this point. I hope. But also, you know, maintain social distancing. Um, I had a conference call with um, Social Hospital, or it's now called Social Health Systems, on Friday. The curve is bending. The governor's talked about it as well, but it's not bending fast enough. And the hospital system in the greater Boston area is pretty much near capacity, where um, we don't want to open another field hospital. No hospital, no medical provider wants to see another field hospital go up. But that is the distinct possibility at some point down the road uh, to have one in the southeast region, like we saw um, during the middle of the summertime. So, uh, you know, just want to remind folks again, I mean, you know, the only way we can take care of COVID and or take care of ourselves is that we do our we do take care of ourselves and do our part you know, to keep the spread from continuing. And, uh, you know, that's all I can do to keep reminding folks. If folks want to uh, comment on your bill, Techie, uh, how do they do that? Well, they can call at 617-722-2014, 617-722-2014. You can try my email at tacky, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. So tacky dot chan at mahouse.gov. I do remind folks my email box is now starting to get inundated as we move into profiling fi- season. But also, if you're not in the Quincy area, definitely please contact your local legislators at uh, mahlegislature.gov or just use a search engine. You can just Google it up or bing it up uh, to find your own legislator um, as well. So you can find your state senator, your state rep, and contact them if you're not um, from the Quincy area. Great. Right. Doctor, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank Tacky for always uh, you know, helping us bring the criti- medically critical information to the forefront. Uh, it's important that we continue to work together, You know, journalists, uh, legislators, because only then would we be able to protect our communities. Uh, We can't do it all on ourselves, all on our own, and we definitely need your help. So I really appreciate all of that. Thank you so much. Very welcome, gentlemen. Thank you both. Always uh, great to talk to you. And uh, Tacky, we'll catch up with you again uh, later this week. Well, we always look forward to your uh, beautiful smile every week throughout this pandemic. Likewise. (laughs) All right, be well. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.